Boom, it's closed. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for tuning in once again. Just tooling up to do the next episode on the old 5J. But first, I thought I'd throw in an 1113 video short. I'll try and keep it brief, I promise. But a lot of good discussion came up in the comment section below the last video about the press fit taper. Specifically, when I pressed the bevel gear and hub onto the shaft and wonder at how they hold together without slipping and still transmit all the power that goes through the back end of a crawler tractor. Well, actually, it's just something that to answer that instead of doing a bunch of typing, it's probably easier just to show you via another, albeit smaller example, and basically just try and get the point across that way. So that's what I'm going to do. So instead of trying to look in the back of 1113's housing and that rather small compartment and half the things we want to see are already hidden, I just pulled 2115's old bevel gear and shaft out and put it back on the bench because all the details are the same here. One question that came up was, uh, isn't there supposed to be a key installed between the gear and the shaft? And yes, I put the key in. It was something I mentioned in passing on 1113, but you couldn't get a really good view of it. But you can see it fits in the keyway right in there, just like this one's positioned. And then the next question was, is it the key that prevents the gear from turning on the shaft? And we will say yes, but primarily no. The key's kind of secondary. So we pressed the gear onto the shaft on 1113, like I mentioned, at 12 tons of pressure. So to a small extent, that actually expanded that tapered hub onto the taper of the shaft. And just that taper is enough to hold a lot. So to illustrate that point, we'll come over here to the, the tiny little bench lathe. So you look at the tailstock piece here. This is a Morse taper is what it's called. It's a standard multi-sized taper fit for tooling in, in machines like this. This is a number two Morse taper. I believe it goes zero through seven with a four and a four and a half in between, but this is the two. So that's what a number two Morse taper looks like. We're just under three quarters of an inch diameter at the large end of the taper, and I don't remember what the back end is, but you know, you get the idea. That's about the size of it. So, and the way this works, there's no keyway on here. This is just basically a friction fit. So like this drill bit would go into the tailstock and just from using hand pressure, you already can't pull that thing back out. And you can do all the drilling you want with this. It's not gonna spin, it's not gonna move. And to get it back out, the only way you can do it is to start basically cranking the tailstock back. It has this plunger that, that has a lead screw in here attached to that crank. It, it runs the end in or out. So we just start rolling this back and right there, you can feel you come up against the stop. That's the end of that lead screw actually touching the back end of that drill bit. And the only way you get the drill bit out is to keep turning. There we go. And that actually disengages that taper and you can pull the drill bit back out again. So like I said, this is just a number two. And I believe once you get up to the number seven Morse tapers, the large end of that tapered shaft is just over three and a quarter inches. So yeah, you can look at the twisted off shaft that originally was in 2115. That's two and a half inches right there. So if we go at the, I'll put my thumb at the three and a quarter mark. That's how big from where my thumb is right here off to the other end. That's how big the large end of a number seven Morse taper would be. And just to think just that taper alone holds that tooling, keeps everything from spinning. And you, you need another means to force it back out. That's just all friction right there. That's not even getting into press fit yet. So the fact that we press that hub on at 12 tons, just that taper alone without the keyway is going to hold a lot. And the keyway is kind of, it's, it's kind of a means of alignment, but it is, it's kind of a secondary line of defense. So if anything was ever strong enough to want to make that taper start to slip, the keyway is there to, or the key, I should say, is there to stop it. Now, I don't know specifically how much force a 12 ton press fit taper can hold in the back of the D2. I know that it's enough to twist off an inch and three quarter diameter shaft and there is no signs of damage to the keyway. There's no cracking in the corners, nothing splayed out, and there's no indication that anything has slipped on the taper either. So you could probably calculate that if you brought out the math that has the alphabet in it. 
personally, when they bring out the math that has the alphabet in it, my typical reaction is simply just to... <laughs> and you're probably thinking I'm just being sarcastic. No, that's true. Anyway, back on topic. One final thing I'll talk about as long as I have these pieces out here. Somebody asked, how does that fold over lock work back here? And what do you fold it on to on the bevel gear, being that the new style doesn't have that little tang that engages with the key slot like the originals did? Well, that little tang doesn't do anything. And typically, like the one back behind it, you'll take those first gen ones apart and the tang's already been broken off and it's, it's MIA anyhow. So they decided that wasn't needed because you can see where the bevel gear hub bumps up right here around that key slot. And what you do is you utilize this side of that uh, that bump because you have a little bit of a flat right here you can push it fold it down onto that and it's not going to be able to negotiate up that transition past the high point and continue on around you want to use this side because that's going to resist counterclockwise rotation if you folded it against this side you'd do just about one full turn before you came up on the high spot again then it would be ineffective so with it folded on to the flat before this transition and then fold it up against one of the flats of the nut. You've basically locked the nut to that hub. Nothing's gonna turn, nothing's gonna move, and it's all, well, fold over lock perfection from there. So this has been the 1113 video short. I'm hoping to keep it under five minutes. We'll see how I did when I go and put it together. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm gonna get to work on the next installment.